And then, of course, as Rob was saying, you need a long-term exit strategy. Unfortunately, in the 1970s bull market, there were a lot of people just like you and me who endured the pain. I mean, there, it was a lot of volatility in that decade, but they saw the writing on the wall. They saw what that the Fed was trapped and uh, money, you know, inflation was going to run rampant, but they didn't have an exit strategy. And a lot of those people uh, lost, they ended up bag holders. They didn't take profits or they didn't take enough profits. And um, shoot, I meant to have the book with me, but David Morgan and David Smith wrote a fantastic book on this topic. It's called Second Chance. Highly recommend it for everyone. And it will help you to craft your own long-term exit strategy. And it's something that's helped me a lot in crafting my own. Rob's a tough act to follow. That was an awesome presentation. And uh, thank you, Rob, for all that great info. Also honored to be here to speak amongst uh, the other speakers here, David Morgan, David Smith, Nick Barashif. Uh, if you told me three years ago, I'd be able to share a, a virtual stage with these guys, I wouldn't have believed you. So I'm just truly humbled and honored and grateful to be here with each and every one of you guys too. Uh, you guys are my kind of people, the kind of person that's going to be here during the week to attend a summit like this. Or we've got a lot in common. So uh, just humbled and honored to be here. Thank you, Rob, for inviting me. Absolutely. So Welcome I, to the program. Happy to have you on, Steve, because I think a lot of people respect what you do and respect the amount of work that you put into it. I'm going to jump off stage so you can okay. uh, you know, have your broadcast. We'll come back on and answer some uh, questions. So if you guys are in the chat, put questions down during Steve's presentation. I'll come on and ask them. We'll get answers and uh, we'll go from here. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, brother. So when I thought about topics for this talk, my mind immediately went towards more sexy topics like um, hedging strategies, short-term swing trading strategies to generate monthly cash flow. That would be a fun one. Or crafting a personalized long-term exit, exit strategy. And th these are all things I'm really into. But as I thought more about it, I thought about you know what gets most overlooked in our community. And I think it's building the basics, the basics for uh, building a foundation and a structure towards achieving financial freedom. So that's what we're going to do today. I put these six steps together. Some of these might be pretty basic to a lot of you, but I think this is the order that we that really should be, we should all go in. And I say that because it breaks my heart sometimes. I see a lot of brand new people who wake up to all the things like Rob was just talking about, and they just jump in head first. And that, that's a good thing, but they usually go right to the things that you should be doing last. Speculating in small penny stocks, trading options, um, I've heard so many stories that have just broken my heart. Um, and that's really what prompted me to do this. One of our our members, I, I, I advise people do not do this. And, you know, he was unemployed and um, kids and, you know, he lost one of his children and um, he got margin called from trading, you know, penny stocks or doing this wild risk thing where there's a place for that, but you, that's last. We want to build our foundation first. So that, that's some of the things I'm going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about is exactly what I'm doing with my own personal money. And, you know, hopefully this helps you guys. All right. So ha first of all, we all want to get to financial independence. That's the goal. That's why we're doing this. I think most people here probably aren't here because they want to go buy a yacht or a Lambo. Although those are cool. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think most of us are here because we want something more. And for, for me, that's time freedom to pursue life's higher callings, things of eternal significance. I want that time freedom to really pursue what matters in life. And I think this framework or roadmap is the best way to get there. Um, so first of all, let's define what is financial independence. Uh, to me, financial independence is when your money works harder than you do. It's when you no longer have to work, but you get to work. You get to choose the kind of work you do because it's fulfilling. It helps people. You're passionate about it. We all have a sweet spot where our passions and our abilities intersect. And when you're financially free, I mean, you're free to go do all that stuff. You're not bogged down by a job unless you want to. So that's the goal here. So I think this is the roadmap to get there. So number one is identify the goal. That's how I identify it. Then lay out a series of steps to achieve it. Whenever you have a goal, it's great to say, hey, I've got, here's my goal. Well, how are you going to achieve it? And I think these are the steps to follow. And like Rob was saying, traditional tactics are likely to be ineffective. If you go visit your financial, traditional financial planner, they're probably going to talk to you about a 60-40 stock bond portfolio and uh, all these things that I think are going to be very ineffective for the next few years and probably even longer than that. So just a little bit of background on my story. Um, I, I grew up, my parents were hardworking blue collar workers. They're both uh, self-employed house painters and they had to work right up until, you know, uh, my dad passed away last year, but right up until really he died, he, he had to work because they had no financial education, none at all. 
they, they were good, hardworking people. They taught me so many valuable lessons, but they, they were financially illiterate and we're all responsible for our own decisions. But at the same time, there's some blame on this education system here because our schools, from the time you go to kindergarten through college or even higher education than that, they train you to one, be an employee. And there's nothing wrong with being employed, but they don't teach you how to run a business and they don't teach you how to manage your money. They teach you, you need Wall Street to do that for you. They're the smart ones. They'll help you when quite the opposite is true. And, you know, my, my parents suffered for that. They, they were always stressed about money. And I grew up seeing that. And that's why I'm so passionate about this right now and why I, lo I love doing what I do and getting to share what I've learned with you guys and learning from you guys as well. I think it's important to have a why. This is my why. I, I want more time to spend with my family. We homeschool them and um, I want to be home. I want to move on to a ranch someday. And that's my why. And I, I mentioned that because th this is not easy. There are going to be times where this is hard. The path is going to be rough. And, you know, keeping your why at the top of your, you know, at the forefront of your mind will help you to, you know, not throw in the towel and quit. All right. So here's the high level overview of the six steps to prosper as the great reset approaches. I gave these little steps titles that maybe you wouldn't be able to figure out um, rather than just say what they are to build a little bit of uh, intrigue. So build your moat, own your income, widen your moat, fill your tax free buckets. Now it's time to speculate and then pursue your sweet spot with reckless abandon. So we'll just talk briefly about each of these. Each bullet, bullet point here could be its own 20, 30 minute conversation. So we'll just give a high level overview. And like I said, I bet many of you have already checked these boxes. And if that's the case, just move on to the next one. But the idea is if, if you don't have step one done yet, but you're off doing step seven, you know, trading options on penny stocks or something crazy like that, probably you might want to rethink that and go back and re revisit this order of things. Um, and I, I say that because I think many of us, when we learn these things, we're tempted to go put all our money <clears throat> into this one basket. I did that. I learned about this back in 2007, eight. I mean, I, I used debt. I sold all my stuff and I just went all in and that was fine, but I, that probably wasn't the right order to do it. And I didn't have a strategy to accumulate quality mining stocks and physical metal. So step number one here, build your moat. The idea here is to put a buffer, a one month buffer between you and a short term financial emergency. Now the standard financial advice is get a thousand bucks or excuse me, get a thousand or 2000 bucks of cash. I think one month of emergency savings is step number one, but you and I both know cash is trash, cash, <laughs> cash, it, you're guaranteed to lose purchasing power. So what I personally advocate for is, let's say you make $10,000 a month for easy math. Take 5,000 bucks in cash, put it outside of the banking system. We're all trained to keep our money in the banking system. Um, I think having some outside, it makes a lot of sense. So $5,000 in cash, and then I would take 5,000, put it into precious metals, probably an ounce of gold and 100 ounces of silver. That comes to about $5,000. That's what I would do. That's my buffer for short-term emergencies. One month of food and water. Not many people talk about this. And those who do talk about pr practical preparedness, they want to jump right into, hey, buy five years worth of freeze-dried food. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, uh, most of us have deeper pantries and we can just organize our pantries to buy more of the food we, we already eat anyway that has a long shelf life. And if anything, it's just going to be more expensive by the time you actually go to eat it. So it's kind of an inflation hedge as well. I I'm also a big advocate for a Berkey water filter. Berkey water filter allows you to take rainwater, you know, river water, almost any kind of non-salt water, run it through that thing. And now you've got drinking water. I mean, what a cheap insurance policy. It's a couple hundred bucks and you've got almost a lifelong uh, supply of water. And then number three here is plug the holes by telling your money where to go. And that's just being on a simple budget. All right. Number two here is own your income. And I'll be honest, just a couple of years ago, I did not agree with this at all. Like I said, I use debt because it's common within our community to say, well, de debt's going to eat away inflation. And there's truth to that, but that doesn't mean we should just go pile up on consumer debt. Um, I, I did that. I, I bought new cars and I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> we got hyperinflation coming. Um, you know, $25,000 car is going to be like a couple hundred bucks in a year or two from now. Uh, I don't think that's a smart way to go about it. Uh, Proverbs 22 says the borrower is servant to the lender or slave to the lender. And I think most of us would agree that if we are headed towards the greater depression or whatever you want to call it, I don't want to go into that carrying all this consumer debt. I want to go into that thing debt-free, emergency savings, and then speculating wisely. 
So own your income. If you don't, if, if you're uh, d- laden with debt to these credit card companies, JP Morgan owns your debt. These credit card companies own it because you're paying them interest. They own your income. You want to own your income. So I, I would say eliminate all consumer debt. There's uh, two different schools of thoughts on how you do that. Do you start with the lowest balance first or do you start with the highest interest rates? I'm not going to argue either way there. Um, from a purely mathematical perspective, it would say, you would say, hey, I'm going to start with the highest interest rate debt work my way on that one. Once that's gone, work to the nice, next highest interest rate. However, I think there's a lot to be said for starting with the smallest first because you get those small emotional victories. And then what about a low fixed rate income, low fixed rate mortgage? Um, I'm kind of torn on this one. I threw that in there. I don't have an answer for it. I've got a 30 year fixed at 2.67% or something like that. So it's, it's really hard for me to pay that down because I'm pretty confident I can do better than 2.67% speculating in the market. Um, so I'll leave that that one out there. Uh, maybe we can discuss that in the questions after. I'd be interested to get Rob's thought on that, thoughts on that, actually. Um, I think about the Great Reset crowd. Most of you have probably heard good old Klaus Schwab saying, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. I was going to try and imitate his voice, but I, I don't think I can pull that off. But I think they've made it pretty clear that they want to create a renter society where home ownership is almost goes away. And they can change the rules of the game. That's why I'm reluctant to carry this uh, fixed rate mortgage into the greater, the great reset, because they can change the rules of the game. Uh, There's kind of a conundrum where inflation helps debtors, but it hurts creditors, right? So who's the biggest debtor in the world? U.S. government. So inflation helps them, but who's the biggest creditor? The banks. Well, for the most part. So you have this scenario where do the banks win or does the government win? And I bet they engineer some kind of solution where they both win and you and I lose. And th- that's why I'm more inclined to g- get rid of all debt. But that's a that's a discussion maybe for later or a different show. All right, step number three here. Three of six is to widen your moat. And what we're going to do here is just take what we did in step number one, one month of savings, and we're going to broaden that out to six to 12 months. And just like we did in step one, we're going to have some in cash physical metals. And then, you know, if you make, let's say you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, um, do you want to have 40, $50,000 of precious metals in your home? Um, maybe, I mean, it depends on certain circumstances, but that's where I think vaulted storage can become an option. Uh, A lot of people will ask me about PSLV and why do I need to own physical when there's PSLV it's physically backed. And I believe that to be true. However, I like to say, do not conflate or confuse PSLV as a good, as a viable substitute for physical metal stored outside of the banking system that you can put your hands on. Yes, I know there's a a clause where you can take delivery, but I I don't think it's as simple as many people think and you need to be, uh, you know, own a large position. So maybe some PSLV, I'm not anti-PSLV, but don't think that's just, I don't need physical metal because I have PSLV. Just wanted to throw that out there. Now we're going to broaden our food and water supply out to six to 12 months. How nice would it be to to go into the Great Depression and know you've got a year's worth of food supply? Now, I I recently looked into that freeze-dried food and the organic stuff, and that stuff is expensive. I mean, it's like 10 grand to get almost, I don't know, six, seven months worth for a family of five like I have. So what I found for me that was actually cheaper was to go buy two extra freezers, used freezers for seven, 800 bucks, put them in the garage and fill them with food, you know, two, two years worth of food. And I also went and got a backup solar generator with an EMP bag. I, I took that extra step um, in case there's some kind of event like that so that I can power those freezers and a small oven, you know, in the event of some kind of catastrophic scenario. Um, but anyway, th- I found that as a kind of a unique solution as, as opposed to paying for that freeze dried food. It was actually cheaper to go do all that. And it's food I'll actually like and enjoy and it's healthy. So when we think about uh, that emergency savings, having that physical component, there's no right or wrong here, but I think a lot of people say, well, silver's too risky. And I would say, don't conflate the volatility with risk. Yes, silver is much more volatile than gold. And if you can't stomach that volatility, that's fine. But I, I also honestly think silver is lower risk than gold over the next 12 to 24 months, or call it even longer than that, over the next few years. It's historically cheaper, and the ratio suggests that. I personally have a lot more of my money in silver than I do gold. Here's the gold to silver ratio going back to 1975, and you can see where we are here. We're at uh, 80 to 1, interestingly, just above or approaching a key resistance level, 
an 80 to one ratio, you don't, you can see on this chart in the last 45 years, we've spent very little time above an 80 to one ratio. And whenever you do go above there, it's usually pretty short lived. So I think that speaks to silver's undervaluation relative to gold here. This isn't for everyone. I, I view platinum as more speculative as part of that emergency savings, but platinum is actually undervalued relative to silver. Um, I was stunned when I started looking into this, but it actually is on a ratio basis. Platinum has the potential to outperform silver. That doesn't mean it's going to, but it does have that potential. So for, for me, I like about 20% of my physical and platinum. Here, here's my personal allocation between silver, platinum, and gold. This isn't the one size fits all for everybody, but in the interest of full transparency, this is what I'm doing. So I, I've got 70% in silver, 20% in platinum, and I'm trying to get that gold allocation up to about 10%. So 70, 20, 10 for me. And I like the idea of swapping platinum for gold or silver if and when those ratios normalize. That's an advanced step and there's risks with that because there's always the chance that we just can't get the physical. The physical isn't available to swap. So uh, you want to build something you're happy holding if you're unable to swap, but that is an upside kicker. Um, platinum is extremely undervalued relative to gold and silver, and I would love to be able to swap my platinum for much more gold down the road. All right, step number four here. This one is so easily overlooked by the precious metals community because unlike the rest of the world who wants all their money in the system, we tend to want all of our money out of the system, all of it. And I can see that, I can relate to that, but I think there are some instances where it makes sense to have some in. And I say that because this doesn't get as much attention as it should. There's a tax tsunami coming. It may seem like taxes are high and they are. They're not, it's not fair. I don't agree with our tax structure. But historically, taxes are actually low here in the United States. And you can bet your bottom dollar that taxes are going to be going up, not down, in the years ahead. And there's some tools that we can use as informed investors to protect ourselves from that. So I'm a big fan of the Roth IRA. And I like to say, save 15% for retirement. And the my preference is take the company match. If you get a match, I say take it. And then within those options that your company gives you, Try and, usually there's some options that are less bad than just you know the S&P 500. Um, so tr try and pick the best options in there that you can. And better yet, if your company has a Roth 401k, even better. I, I like to say get as much money into that Roth as you can because the way a Roth works is it's after tax. You get no tax benefit now, but that money grows tax-free. So a, a good analogy is the seed is taxed, but the harvest grows tax-free. And that's what I like. If you've got all your money, like a lot of people in a traditional 401k, let's say you got a million bucks in there. You can log into your account and it'll say a million dollars. But how much is actually there? How much purchasing power? You don't know because you don't know what the tax rate is going to be when you go to retire. And you know a Roth, you know. You know for sure what it's going to be. Um, I, I put this little graphic here because the, the next pushback towards a Roth or any kind of retirement account is, well, the government's just going to take it or change the rules. I, I agree. That's a very real risk. One of the biggest questions I get about precious metals is, are they going to confiscate our silver and gold? Maybe, but or they might try to. But I think the low-hanging fruit, the last vestige of wealth for Americans, I'm talking US-centric here, is in traditional IRAs. And you can see this graph that was taken at the end of 2020. There's over $10 trillion in traditional IRAs. Look at Roths. 0.7 trillion. That's nothing. That's a drop in the bucket. So I don't think it's worth expending the political capital for these greedy governments to go after Roths. Um, that would just, that, I think there'd be riots in the streets if they did that. So I think Roth is the safest way to go for planning for retirement. And it's really nice to have that tax-free growth. And you can do a self-directed IRA or a self-directed Roth IRA. And you know, I, I, my wife and I max that thing out every year. And I, right now, I'll just be honest with you, it's all in SILJ, Junior Silver Miners. I have, I have the freedom to choose exactly what I want. It's not company options. It's a self-directed Roth and it grows all tax-free. All right. Let me look at my notes, make sure I didn't miss anything on that one. <clears throat> okay. One, one last thing you can say, hopefully I'm not beating this horse to death, but you know, let, let's say your company does not have a Roth 401k option. Uh, they, there's something called a Roth conversion that you can do. And I, I try and do that every year where you take money from the traditional IRA move it over to a Roth and you pay the taxes on it. But we, we don't have to go too in the weeds there. All right. So now at this point, you've got 
six to 12 months of emergency savings. You've got no consumer debt. You're saving for retirement in a as much as you possibly can in the tax-free bucket. Now you're, I would be feeling pretty good about myself. Now it's time to play offense and speculate. And then I think this is the time to start looking at some of those fun things, um, options, trading, explorers and developers, getting aggressive with our speculations. And this chart here goes back to 1900. And when I see this chart, I see opportunity because as you guys have probably seen this many times before, commodities have never been so undervalued relative to general equities. And I say never, I mean, it's, I think it's gone a little bit lower since March of 2020 was that the nadir of this uh, chart. So I think we did make an all time low going back the last hundred years, but regardless, commodities are historically cheap. This is what I believe to be a generational opportunity. And those who speculate wisely stand to benefit, but you have to have a plan. When most people are new to this, they hear about a stock on Twitter or one guy mentions uh, mentions it on a YouTube channel and they say, oh yeah, I'll get that one. I think there's a lot more that goes into crafting a uh, mining stock portfolio. So we'll kind of talk through that really briefly. And I'm talking qu quickly here because I want to save time for questions at the end. So here, here's my handful of steps for uh, building out a mining stock portfolio. It's not just, you know, you take one shot and do it all at once. You, I would do this a little bit over time, but the first question to ask yourself is how much do you want to allocate to these sectors? The answer doesn't have to be 100%. I think of a whole financial pie and you decide what slice of that pie do I want to put into mining stocks? There's no right or wrong answer. My, I've got a big, big portion and I'm comfortable with the volatility, but you know, it doesn't have to be that. So decide ahead of time. What is your position sizing, your desired position sizing? Number two, how do you want to structure your portfolio? How do you want to diversify jurisdictionally? What percentage of your portfolio do you want in top tiers, mid tiers, and high risk speculations? These are simple questions, but not many people ask them. But once you've answered these questions, position size, jurisdictional diversification, top tier, mid tier, uh, high risk speculations, now you've got a framework. And when you hear about a stock or something to go look at, you've got a framework, a structure to plug it into and see if it fits within your plan. As opposed to just, oh, that one sounds good. I'll go get it. <laughs> so now you've got a structure. Now, obviously, stock selection is important. And as anyone who's new to the sector or who's been in the sector for a while knows, stock selection is it's different analyzing mining stocks. It's a whole different skill set that, you know, financial advisors and Wall Street people, they don't, they just don't have these skills. So I think it's important to learn from people who have been doing this for a long time. There's so many good people in this sector. Rob interviews a, a ton of them all the time. But I'll just mention Jeff Clark, Lobo Tigre, David Morgan, David Smith. I look to those guys for a lot of wisdom in many areas. But when it comes to stock selection, I really like them. And I'm, I'm humbled and honored to have Jeff Clark contributing to our, our newsletter as well. He's my mining stock guy. All right, uh, next one here, um, accumulation strategy. It's important to decide, am I going to just buy all the, buy the stock all at once when I decide I want it, or do I scale in? You can dollar cost average. You can scale in on weakness, on pullbacks to logical support levels, or buy technical breakouts. Personally, I dollar cost average into physical metals each month. But when it comes to accumulating mining stocks, I have my watch list and I wait patiently. Sometimes I'll have to wait a few months for it to pull back to my uh, target that I've used charts to identify. We just added one the other day that I had been waiting since last July for it to pull back to the support level. And I was begin beginning to think maybe it won't happen. And you have to be okay with that if that's your strategy. Some will get away from you. But I mean, it came right down to that support level, almost to the penny. And I'd waited patiently. My patience was rewarded. And I got that stock for you know 50% less than I would have had I bought it a few months ago. Another strategy is to buy technical breakouts. That's more of a strategy I use for short-term trading, but uh, it's something to consider. And then, of course, as Rob was saying, you need a long-term exit strategy. Unfortunately, in the 1970s bull market, there were a lot of people just like you and me who endured the pain. I mean, there, it was a lot of volatility in that decade, but they saw the writing on the wall. They saw what, that the Fed was trapped and uh, money, you know, inflation was going to run rampant, but they didn't have an exit strategy. And a lot of those people uh, lost, they ended up bag holders. They didn't take profits or they didn't take enough profits. And um, shoot, I meant to have the book with me. But David Morgan and David Smith wrote a fantastic book on this topic. It's called Second Chance. Highly recommend it for everyone. And it will help you to craft your own long-term exit strategy. And it's something that's helped me a lot in crafting my own. 
And then finally, the last step, this one's kind of vague, but it's pursue your sweet spot with reckless abandon. This is the light at the end of the tunnel. I think we all agree we're headed into some hard times, um, but there is the possibility and to prosper amidst chaos and in, in the midst of hard times. So, you know, it's easy to get bogged down and down in the dumps with all the, you look at, you watch the news or read Zero Hedge, it's, it's hard to not get depressing, but you can still pursue your sweet spot with reckless abandon, live, live a fulfill, fulfilling life where you help and serve other people. And, you know, f there, there's things we can do to prosper in this environment. Uh, what, someone I like to listen to says, stepping towards your calling requires stepping away from your comfort. And every time I've stepped away from my comfort and a little bit closer to my calling, I've never looked back. Um, and having financial freedom, being free from the rat race, just frees you up to go pursue the things that you really care about in life. Since we have a couple minutes, Rob, jump in if I'm going too long here. I think I've got about uh, another two minutes. Just a couple of um, charts that I think are really noteworthy to me. These are long-term charts. Gold is undervalued relative to general equities. And you can see, just to get back to where we were in 1980, on a gold versus the Dow Jones, uh, gold would outperform stocks by a factor of 20. Um, that sounds crazy, but that's what happened before, and I think it's very likely to happen again. Silver is even more undervalued relative to stocks. Now, this one sounds even crazier, but if silver to Dow ratio went to where it was in 1980, silver would outperform general equities by a factor of 50. That sounds crazy, but it's happened before, and history may not repeat exactly, but it usually rhymes. Uranium, we didn't talk about this one here. I'll just uh, show you this chart to maybe whet your appetite if this is a sector you haven't looked at closely. Uranium is cheap versus gold. It looks very good technically. The supply-demand fundamentals are very compelling, and I think it's worth you know speculating into. Um, so a lot of us precious metals investors are all in silver and gold. There's some other uh, hard assets that look really well, real, look really good as well to include copper, nickel, platinum, and uranium. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, Rob, feel free to hop back on if that's good for you. Hopefully yeah. you guys found this helpful. Ho hopefully it wasn't too simplistic. Okay. Yeah, no, we do have a few questions. One of them is from Antonio Pietraniero from our chat. And he says, hi, Steve, thanks for a great pro service. Not a young man anymore. What do you uh, recommend for us old timers where wealth preservation is a bigger priority? Yes. Um, for me, this is what I would do. I can't give financial advice. I meant to mention that in the beginning. I'm not a financial advisor. Um, so I, I would personally be looking more towards physical and I would look to speculate in the royalty companies as I believe they've got those type of business models have a much more favorable risk reward profile. The wheat and precious metals of the world, the sandstorm golds, some of the nice royalty companies um, build a core around those. And then if you want to speculate a little bit, you can. Yeah, I got you. A lot of people love the presentation because I think you got into the nuts and bolts of things to do outside your portfolio. So I had a question for you. Sure. When did you realize you needed to do things other than your stock investments and your, your financial investments in terms of uh, getting ready for what may be big changes in, in our supply chain. Oh man. Um, I think I learned about the financial system and all the the uh, inherent instability in the world, let's call it that, at all about the same time. Mm -hmm. So I, I've just been full circle. I went full hardcore prepper. I'm just being transparent with you guys. I mean, I was pretty hardcore prepper 2013, 2014. Okay. And, and that's a good thing, but it also, I, I was always living in fear kind of and worry. So I finally, after, you know, almost 10 years now, I think I found a sweet spot where I'm aware of the things in the world. I do what I can. I take the steps that I can. Uh, and, but if there's, if it's out of my control, uh, I've learned to kind of not, not worry about it, be aware of it, but not live my life and worry about it. Uh, another question, similarly from John Hornicle. Some of us are in our mid sixties. Um, how do we adjust our financial independent strategy, more metal, less financial assets? So in other words, do you, are there certain things that you think are better that, that may be more liquid, less, less beta to them than other things as you get older and, and you're more about wealth, wealth preservation? Yeah, I think physical metal may be more gold than silver in that case, even though I think silver is more undervalued, it's volatile in the royalty and streaming companies. And this is outside of my expertise, but I think the closer you are to retirement, the more important it is to try and get, if you have a retirement account, to get things over into that tax-free bucket and their strategies yeah. to do that. And so talking about the tax-free bucket, I, I used to be a licensed broker years ago, no longer am. 
but they, we, we talked about tax advantages versus whether you do a regular IRA or Roth IRA and redemptions. So Roth is after tax, but don't you also get taxed on the capital gains whenever you do end up redeeming whatever's in your Roth? No, that, that's what's beautiful about it. If, if you put 10 grand in there now and you just let it sit and you hit retirement and it's $150,000, you don't pay gain, capital gains on that $140,000 of capital gain. Um, it grows tax free. And, and you've also got the ability to, I think it's 6,000 now um, is the limit. And there's income limits on this too. If you needed to, you can take that money back. You can't take back the capital gain. But if I put six grand in a few years ago, I can just go log in, withdraw, and boom, I get my six grand back penalty free. Yeah, that's nice. That's a nice way to do it. The, the problem I've always had with a lot of the qualified investments, and I figured this out when we became a licensed broker, is they lock in until 59 and a half. Mm -hmm. You're in a very small portfolio of investments in which somebody else is managing. And when you really, Steve, when you go, let's say there are 10, portfolio 10 portfolio choices in your 401k or your pension mm -hmm. you, you could pick the top three but then you mm -hmm. look at the top three the prospectuses and the holdings and they're holding the same stuff it's right. almost like you're investing in the same sectors over and over they're just different names so you're not really all that diversified it the, yeah. the portfolio risk was just huge in that type yeah. of investment if the 401ks would have more lenient distribution rights and you can truly invest in whatever you wanted I'd say it's a great vehicle because you get company match, mm -hmm. but, but it's not a great vehicle when they're forcing you into certain things in a broad market, which is overvalued and you're locked yeah. into 59 and a half penalties. And it's almost like what advantage is that to, to, to somebody, Let, let's say you're, you know, younger, uh, millennial, older mm -hmm. Gen Z, you're getting, you're, you're just first starting out. Does getting in one of these qualified investments for the next 40 years make sense? Yeah, that's it's a really tough question. I think the Roth does. The the company match, I'll be honest, I was torn between putting as on that priority list, take the match and then the self-directed Roth. I, I think the self-directed Roth, from my perspective, is almost a no-brainer. Um, the company match, I mean, you get, let, let's say you, you, you're, the asset class you invest in goes down by half. Mm -hmm. Well, the match offsets that. I mean, I can see these things going down by more than half. That's why I really like that self-directed Roth because you can put it into hard assets and things right. like that. Well, thank you, Steve, so much. I think we got our next speaker up. Uh, everybody congratulate Steve Penny for a wonderful presentation. And if you want to find him, Steve, how do people reach out to you? You bet. I'm on uh, Twitter at Silver Chartist, and we just started a new website with a mobile app and everything. That's a premium membership, and silverchartist.com will take you there. Actually, you, you know what? Uh, silverchartistpros.com. That's where you can get a, a slightly discounted rate. For, you know, we keep it really affordable, but you know, we're, we're happy to partner with you, Rob. And silverchartistpros.com is for the listeners of this uh, broadcast. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate Steve, you for coming on. We'll be back on the channel again. Appreciate your charting service. And, and I love this presentation. It was great. Awesome. Thank you.